Emily. Good morning, everyone. As Brian has already said, we're reading from Matthew chapter 6, Matthew being the first book of the New Testament. Reading from verses 1 through to 18. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast... Do not look sombre as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Thank you, Endra. This is God's Word and is given for our good. Now, please keep your Bibles open at Matthew chapter 6. Uh, If you've received the newsletter email, you will have got an outline from me last night or yesterday afternoon. I hope that will be some help to you. And uh, Simon, I need to let you know the battery is flat on the phone, so I can't change the slides myself. I will try to make sure I let you know when to change. Father's Day. Oh, I should say too, um, if you have any questions that come up, Put them in the chat box and uh, I will address them afterwards. All right, Father's Day. Days like this can be wonderful and they can be difficult. And I want to acknowledge both aspects of that. They can be wonderful days and they can be difficult days. For those who have grown up with a stable family relationship with a mum and dad who love each other and love you as a child, who have been a really positive role model 
for you and especially if you've also had a grandfather who's been close to you and a you know, good connection there, um, then Father's Day can be really good. A side note, I, I, I should have prayed in the prayer too for Andrew uh, Enderby, whose grandfather died uh, this week. Our prayers are with you, Andrew. But for those who are now separated from their father because of death, uh, it can be a happy and sad occasion all at once. You're kind of happy for those good memories and sad that the hug is gone, the, you don't hear that voice anymore, uh, and so that can be distressing. But for those who have had an absent father, or worse, an abusive father, and for those who have not had any positive male role model in their life, uh, Father's Day can be understandably difficult. There was a time in church life when we were encouraged uh, to be careful about how we described God and, and perhaps to step away from using the term father. And primarily that was because there were, we didn't know how many people had a really bad experience of a father and trying to present God as father, well, their understanding of that is, is coloured by their own experience. And so it kind of makes sense that we would be careful about using that description of God as Father, where that could actually make it difficult for people to understand God's love. Um, that makes sense. And Father's not the only title used for God in the Scriptures, so we can work around that. Uh, with both of those things in mind, acknowledging that Father's Day can be wonderful and it can be difficult, I want to be clear on a, on a few things. Uh, firstly, the Father I speak about today is God, not you, blokes, uh, not your dads, but God. Uh, second, God is the ultimate example of what a father should be. So as we read about what God does, as we hear about what God is, we, fathers, should want for some of that to be seen in us. Third, God, our Father, is able to do things that are completely impossible for a physical father. So God is our example for us, but there are some things God does that we simply cannot do. I think it's also important to see that when Jesus is showing us how to pray, he begins with that phrase, Our Father. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so if Jesus is going to teach us to address God as our Father, then we should take that on. So if you have a poor example of a father in your life, please listen today. Please listen and hear about a father in heaven who is your father, your true father. And if your own dad is a good example of a father, listen today and, and learn or realise that they are revealing something of God in their life, even if they don't realise that. I should say too at the start that we speak about God as Father. Uh, we can do that fully. Well, we can kind of do that because God is the Father of creation and so he is you know, the father of the whole world, that's true. But in a deeper sense, he becomes our father through adoption. That he adopts us as his children. He adopts us in our sinfulness and through the cross, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the redemption that is gained through him because God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes on him shall have eternal life. Through that we are adopted and so become fully his children. Uh, remember too, the Bible says a lot more about God as Father than just Matthew chapter 6. But we're going to confine ourselves to this chapter. Maybe with a brief reference here and there to other things as well. The unseen Father who sees what is unseen. This is God. The unseen father who sees what is unseen. The father is unseen. We don't see him. 
uh, we, Jesus uses that phrase in relation to prayer and in relation to fasting, verses 6 and verse 18. And the truth is that we might not see God in the room. How many of us have wanted to actually see God? We've wanted to come to church because we want to meet with God. That's, that's a phrase that we we'll use. We, we come to church so we can meet with God and meet with God's people. But we don't see God. He is unseen. And yet, the presence of God is seen. The reality of God is seen. In a similar way that we see the results of wind. We see the leaves moving. We see the trees swaying. We see the trees fall at times because of the wind, but we don't see the wind itself. In a similar way, we see the results of God being with us. You might have some stories in your own life about the way that you have seen God act. It might be an answered prayer. It might be... A you felt protected. It might be that you, you know God is calling you to do something and so you see the results of God there. He's unseen, but we see the results of him being there. And this unseen father sees what is unseen by everybody else. This father sees what is done in secret. Think about those good things that nobody else knows about. And in fact, Jesus really stresses that when you're doing these things, these good things, you don't need to let anybody else know about it. He talks about giving in verse 4. He talks about praying in verse 6. And he talks about fasting in verses 17 and 18. You don't need to let people know that you're doing these things. In fact, he goes so far as to say, don't even let your left hand know what the right hand is doing. That's like me playing the piano. I don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. It should be so secret that you even forget that you've done it. And what about praying? To go into that secret room, to, to close the door, to be in a place where it's private, not public, so that your Father who is in heaven, your Father who sees what is unseen, sees your praying. It's not about the long-winded prayer. It's not about the words that you use and how fancy they might be. But your heart with God. And then in fasting, don't go around complaining, oh, I'm so hungry. But dress normally, look healthy, and don't tell anybody. There was a time I used to be involved in the 40-hour famine for World Vision. And uh, you know, even as a youth group um, I was a part of, we did that together. It was great. Although there were times when you'd reach that, you know, the first hour is fun, the next hour is difficult, and then 15 hours in it's getting harder and harder. And, and as it goes, it gets harder and harder. And, oh, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry. That's not what Jesus wants. God knows. God sees what is unseen. God sees the good things that no one knows about. Which means that God also sees the not so good things that no one knows about. Those secret habits. Those secret things you don't want anyone else to know about because you'll be embarrassed. Those things that you know that you should actually confess or ask for forgiveness or ask for help but you keep them to yourselves. I think of the things that you have done that you want to hide them away that you want to hide them even from God if you can but Psalm 139 tells us you can't. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, well, God, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So I can't hide in the dark. 
So the things I've done are known to you. Another aspect of God seeing what is unseen means that God sees what has been done to you. Now in Psalm 10, we heard about those people who were proud and arrogant and who would say, we can do what we like, God will never know. And the psalm goes on to say, no, God does know. You think you can get away with this wickedness, but you can't. God knows and you will be called to account. You will face God's justice. So what has been done to you will be repaid. Justice will come. Romans chapter 12, we read this. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. What has been done to you, those things that you don't want anyone else to know, those things that you carry in your own heart and experience, God knows. And in his love, those things do not distance you from him and his justice will come where it is deserved. To such a Father we can pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Next, we see that the Father who sees is the one who rewards. Now, I can't be too specific about what rewards uh, God might give. God isn't in the flyby's business Um, but he is a God who gives and a God who rewards. Three times Jesus tells us this. It's a comment that God rewards those things that are done in secret. The other side of that is when those things are done in public, well, you've already received your reward. So when you give a gift, just give it. Giving in secret, in verse 4, Now, giving in secret can be a very difficult thing to do. We know we should do it. We know we shouldn't be uh, wanting to be rewarded for what we give in secret, but gee, we like it. And and when we do give a gift to someone, we just, you know, we kind of like to hear that it's been well received and, and they're grateful for that. Can you give anonymously? Can you give something to someone in a way that they could never trace it back to you and be content with the gift, not their reaction? In John Bunyan's book, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, one of the characters makes this charming comment. A man there was, though some did count him mad, the more he cast away, the more he had. Or to paraphrase, there was a man, some thought him mad, The more he gave, the more he had. In the giving, there is no losing. In the giving, there is reward. One of the commentators, Hendrickson, did suggest that it might be a good conscience that comes as a reward, rejoicing with those who are the recipients of your goodness. That might be true. And sometimes it is that. Well, what about praying? What about praying in secret? What could be the reward that comes to us when we pray in secret? I wonder what comes to your mind. If you've got the outline there, just jot something down quickly. What might be your thought of a reward that might come to you when you are praying in secret? And why would we pray in secret? I think we would pray in secret because we are trusting God. There are those who would say, if you want something, if if this is your goal, you need to let people know what your goal is. That by this time, I'm going to have this much money or I'm going to have travelled to these places and people will keep you accountable to that and that's your goal. Uh, Well, good luck. But here is something praying in private that no one else knows. So maybe the reward 
is answered prayer. Or maybe the reward is simple contentment, that God will give what I need and I can come to him in prayer. Maybe the reward is the joy of being in God's presence and enjoying time with him. Verse 18 talks about fasting. And fasting means to go without food for a period of time. And here Jesus tells us to do that in secret. Many years ago, I met a young man who was doing that. Uh, We were in a shared facility um, in a training college and I noticed that he wasn't at some meal. So I went to see him, thought, you know, maybe he's a bit shy. I'll invite you, come have dinner with us. Uh, Eventually, (laughs) after I prodded him more than I probably should have, he said, no, he's for the first few weeks here, he's just fasting for those meals and praying. So I felt embarrassed. And yet I think God was rewarding him. Fasting is not about um, dieting. Fasting is not about losing weight. It is a discipline that reminds us of our need for God and that, it help, and that helps us to trust in God for our provision, for what we need. We do it secretly and then trust God. To such a Father we can pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Give us this day our daily bread. And we can see that God rewards those he sees. Though no one else sees it, and though you might not know you're doing God's great work, and Jesus tells a story. I'm going to tell it now. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, these are the words of Jesus, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, And he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. What you have done in secret is seen. Next, we see that the Father knows what we need. The Father knows. Just rest on that, those three words for a moment. The Father knows. If the Father knows, and remember, God is love. Love is the character of God. And if God knows, then you can talk with God freely. You you have no reason to be afraid to talk with God. You can talk with God about your greatest dreams. Those things that you hope to achieve in your life, you can talk with God about them. Not necessarily to seek his approval or his direction, though that's a wise thing to do, but you can just talk with God about your dreams. You can talk with God about your fears. And again, whatever those fears might be, they might seem small, they might be huge, but God knows. And so you can speak with him freely 
about those fears. And you can talk with him about yourself, <laughs> about everything about you, everything. You can talk with God because God knows. Based on that, I want to encourage you, particularly children and youth, young adults as well, don't be afraid to talk with your dad. Don't be afraid to talk with your father. Some of you will object and say, he wouldn't understand. He wouldn't understand. You might be right, but you might be wrong too. And if you don't talk with him, he'll never understand. If you can't explain to him what's going on, how you're feeling, who can? He doesn't understand your music, but he still loves you. So don't be afraid to talk to your dad. You might say, but if I tell him, he'll hate me. What makes you think that? What makes you think that? If we can confess our darkest sins to God and find in him the father who welcomes the prodigal home, can't we do that with our father? And what, why do you assume he will hate you for what you've done? Remember the children's talk? I broke a camera lens. It's just a lens. My father might be disappointed, but he still loves me. And that outweighs whatever is broken. Maybe there are things you're not telling your dad because he'll be shattered if I tell him. He probably won't be. In fact, he probably already knows more than you think. And he probably already knows what you want to tell him. He's just afraid to raise the subject himself. God knows. You can talk to God, but you can talk to your father as well. Let me encourage you to do that. And dads, if you are overwhelmed by what you hear, you're not on your own. We are here to help you. Jesus tells us that the Father also knows what we need, what is needed. Uh, he says, look at the birds. Um, they don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? You're more valuable to God your father than the birds of the air, in all their beauty, in all their wonder, you matter more. And then he says, actually a couple of times in this chapter, he says, don't be like the pagans. They run after all these things. Oh, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Oh, the life of the Christian should be different. So if you're trying to be like the Instagram influencers, stop it. You're being duped. You're being robbed. The Father, your Father, your Heavenly Father knows what you need far more than Google or Facebook or Instagram or any other algorithm. God knows. To such a Father we can pray, Our Father in Heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in Heaven. And then quickly because we could spend way too long on this aspect, but it's really important. The Father forgives. The Father sees, the Father knows, and still this Father forgives. It's a central part of the prayer that Jesus teaches us, and it's also a central part of the life of the kingdom. So we can pray with confidence. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us. I said earlier that we can talk with God about our dreams and about our fears. 
But we can also confess to God our sins, those things that we have done wrong, those things which are very clearly the things he has asked us and told us not to do because he knows it will not be for our good. And yet when we have done them and enjoyed them and then feel the guilt of that, we can come to him with prayer for forgiveness and we can come with confidence. As children, we've all, I expect, had to say sorry to someone. We were probably forced to say sorry to someone. As we've grown, we've probably at times chosen that we actually need to, to apologise to someone. I need to say sorry for this. I need to ask them to forgive me for my actions, for my words, sometimes for my inaction. We can do so with God. We can confess to him. Remember, he is a God who sees what is unseen. So it's not going to be a surprise to him, whatever it is that you are confessing. Now we use a few different words there. Um, Father, forgive us our sins, debts, trespasses. Whatever goes against God's will is what we are asking to be forgiven for. So we can pray with confidence and we can forgive with confidence. We can forgive with confidence. A few years ago, well, many years ago now, uh, I was deeply hurt by the actions of uh, a friend of mine. And uh, another, another mate came to talk with me about that and we talked and he said to me, Brian, you need to forgive him. You need to forgive him. Whether he's done the right thing or the wrong thing, it kind of doesn't matter. You need to forgive him. Let's pray now. And so we did. We, we knelt down together and I began to pray, Lord, I pray that you will forgive my friend for what he's done. And, and at that moment, my mate stopped me and said, Brian, you don't need to pray that God will forgive him. You need to forgive him. I didn't appreciate him interrupting my prayer. But I'm glad he did because he was right. I needed to forgive. We can forgive with confidence because forgiveness sets you free. You can let go of the pain. You can trust God with the justice that must come. To such a Father we can pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Well, this chapter of Scripture gives us the words of Jesus as he teaches on many things. But one thing that seems central to this chapter is the presence of the Father. The Father who sees and who knows and who forgives right through this chapter. The Father who forgives, we later learn, is best seen in Jesus, who forgives when, while he was being crucified, could say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The Father who knows what we need is also seen in Jesus, who knows our greatest need isn't bread or miracles even, but as we see in John chapter 6, what we need is the bread of life, Jesus himself. The Father who rewards us is seen in Jesus as he promises to us, I'm going to my Father's house where I have prepared a place for you in John 14. And the unseen Father is best seen in Jesus. And the Gospel of John helps us to see that very clearly. It's Father's Day. Our great Father is not the bloke we live with or the bloke we grew up with. Our greatest Father is our God in heaven. And so we pray, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. We're going to pray. If you have any questions, please send them through now. Let's pray. Now, Father God, thank you that you are a God who sees what is unseen. 
a God who knows us and our deepest needs and a God who forgives that you are a God of great justice. Lord, help us to lean on you because of your faithfulness. Guide us to you. Draw us to you in Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing. Uh, And I hope you're joining.